My name is Peter Kahn. I'm a second year medical student from the CUNY School of Medicine in New York City and a clinical anatomy fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation. I'll be presenting hip fractures in the elderly, a clinical anatomy review. So what we're going to be reviewing today is first the implications of hip fractures worldwide and then narrowing it down to the United States, going over the anatomy, the relevant surgeries, and then also how age is related to hip fractures. So I'm not reinventing the, the wheel really here today. I'm going to be reviewing a lot of the literature, so keep that in mind while we're going through. So hip fractures worldwide. The population above 65 is projected to double in the next 40 years. And that's really your key population when you're thinking about hip fractures. With that in mind, it was demonstrated that about 150 to 250 hip fractures per 100,000 people per country in most of the industrialized world is is present. And you can see that in the image behind me. And that's all of the countries that you can see in orange. Those in red are above that. So that's essentially all of the industrialized world that, it, that are at these extremely high levels of hip fractures. With that in mind, about 90% of hip fractures are in people that are 65 years and older. So today we're not going to be discussing people that get hip fractures from high impact injury or anything of that nature. So we're really focusing on that low impact kind of falling from a standing position, which seems kind of innocuous if you were just thinking about that. However, there's an increase in mortality over the next 20 years of life for people that have a hip fracture. If that person was younger than 75 years of age when they got that first hip fracture, they're losing about 6.4 years of potential life. And that alone, not going into the amount of hip fracture replacements that we do in the United States, not going into any of those statistics, that number alone basically carries why it's relevant for clinicians and anatomists alike to be aware of the anatomy of hip fractures and then, of course, the surgeries. So let's, we're going to move right into the anatomy here. So starting off very basically, we have the hip joint, multi-axial uh, ball and socket joint between the acetabulum and the femoral head. Acetabulum, as we know, has three different uh, bones that are contributing to it. You have the ischium in the posterior area, the pubis in the anterior, and the ilium in superiorly. Inferiorly, there's the notch that is going to be traversed by the transverse uh, acetabular ligament. So finishing off that full circle. Moving distally, you have the femoral neck, which is attaching to the femoral shaft at approximately a 127 degree angle. Moving more distally, you have the greater trochanter, which you can see here in the image very well, which is shown here in a posterior view. And that has a lot of muscular attachments to your hip abductors. So thinking about your gluteus medius, minimus, uh, maybe your obturator internus muscles, such as that. And then you have your lesser trochanter, which has all the muscular attachments to the hip flexors. So we're going to go back into that when we start talking about the fractures themselves. So now adding more layers to our hip joint, you have the synovial capsule, which stretches out from the acetabular labrum, which is just deepening that acetabulum to have a better fit for your hip joint. The synovial joint is going to stretch out over to the proximal femur and then wrap over the fibrous capsule. That fibrous capsule acts just kind of as a sleeve for your hip joint, which uh, becomes taut in extension, so it's going to provide a lot of stability for those folks. Additionally, that doesn't get a lot of attention besides the issue of femoral, iliofemoral, and pubofemoral ligaments that are supplying that stability. You also have the zonia orbicularis, which is going perpendicular to these ligaments and kind of acting as a sling around the femoral neck. And then lastly, I'm going to quickly mention the uh, ligamentum teres or the ligament to the femoral head. And this is a ligament that has a lot of conflict around it in terms of how much function has in terms of hip stability. Is it only in certain motions of the hip that it provides stability? So I'm just going to leave it as conflicting information, and that probably warrants its own discussion. So now the vasculature. As the big key word about hip fractures is always avascular necrosis of the femoral head. That's the key factor. So what, are the what is the blood supply to the femoral head? Your two main contributors are your uh, medial femoral circumflex artery and your inferior gluteal artery. Really, the real major contributor of those two is your medial femoral circumflex artery. That's about 80% of your blood flow. And you can see it here in the image snaking around to the, uh, to the posterior aspect of the femoral head. 
We're not going to go into all of the particulars because there's vascular foramina that go into the femoral head. They all have very silly names, so just posterior, superior, just kind of telling you the location, so it would kind of be redundant for a lot of you folks today. For the minor contributors, these are only kind of when these other two major contributors aren't picking up their slack that they should be, so that's your lateral femoral circumflex artery, artery of the ligamentum teres, and the superior glute on the obturator arteries. Those last two don't ever have direct connections to the femoral head, but usually will anastomose with those two larger arteries if they don't have sufficient blood flow. So widening our gaze a little bit and looking at potential arteries that could be affected during the surgeries, as you can see here from a posterior view, the two major ones that you're looking out for are your superior gluteal artery, which is sneaking right in between the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus muscles. And then you have your vascular anastomosis inferior to the quadratus femoris muscle. I enjoyed this vascular anastomosis because it tells you exactly where it is, and it's a pretty good guide in terms of a uh, surgeon being aware of where this is. So now, basically staying right in the same area, we're going to talk about the neural structures. So the major one that one is thinking of, particularly from a posterior view, would be your sciatic nerve, coming inferior to your piriformis muscle, and then sneaking in between the uh, ischial tuberosity and the greater trochanter. You also have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve near the uh, anterior superior iliac spine, and your superior and inferior gluteal nerves. Superior gluteal nerve going right with its artery, so that's going to be between gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus again. And then the inferior gluteal nerve is going to be snaking right near the greater trochanter. It even, uh, current literature from Tubbs and colleagues demonstrated that the inferior gluteal nerve continues to kind of snake down towards the greater trochanter, and there's a great amount of variability about how close it gets to the greater trochanter. So now finally we've made it to the hip fractures. Even though they're called hip fractures, we're not including those of the acetabulum, so that's half of the hip gone. So now we're just talking about the proximal femur. And then we're also going to eliminate the femoral head. So now we're just talking about the femoral neck downwards. So the two main groups of the remaining femur that we have left is intracapsular, which is going to be those of the femoral neck, and extracapsular, so those outside the capsule, as the name would imply. So those two, uh, within extra capsule, you're going to have two, which is going to be intertrochanteric and subtrochanteric. As you can see here in the image, subtrochanteric is going to be from that most inferior aspect of the lesser trochanter, and then about five centimeters distal to that. So that area is where you would have a fracture of that nature. So we're going to start off our fractures most proximally. So that's going to be your intracapsular fracture. So those are within the capsule, but not the femoral head. So these are of the femoral neck. The main classification mechanisms that are in the literature are Gardens and Powell's. However, these were created in the 30s and the 50s, and they use, uh, and their whole idea was that the increasing type is an increased risk for malunion. Putting aside the fact that surgeons have an issue of uh, agreeing on what type of garden fracture that they're looking at, regardless of the fact that the garden fracture is only an anterior uh, radiograph, and with the advent of CT scans, it's kind of a, an antiquated mechanism, they're not very useful. Putting all that aside, they're not very useful because they're not demonstrating uh, how poor the patient's outcome is likely to be. So the one that is used most frequently is this AOOTA. However, this one is a research mechanism of classification usually. So there's no really day-to-day -day basis classification mechanism. So this, however, sticking with this research one, because that's the one that we have, we have the AOOTA classification of 31B. The 31B is because three is representative of the femur, one means proximal, and B means intracapsular. A is going to mean extracapsular. The main risk factor that you're looking at for here is going to be osteoporosis. So there's a clear association between osteoporosis and having an intracapsular fracture, which makes up about 50% of all hip fractures. So moving on to surgery, most of these are corrected surgically. There's a small percentage that aren't when they're undisplaced and they're very minor. However, most of these are going to be going in for your your total replacement arthroplasty or your 
uh, hemiarthroplasty. You can see the images here about the differences between those two structures. The total is you're going to have an acetabular component and a femoral head component. However, in the hemiarthroplasty, you're going to not have that acetabular component and you're just going to have the replacement for the proximal femur, as you can see in the images. Internal fixation using screws can be used, but that's mostly going to be reserved for undisplaced fractures. So now there's a lot, as you know, as there is many ways to skin a cat, there's many ways to approach the hip in a replacement. Not to bore you with going through every single one of these and going through the complex approach to each of these, let's just highlight the clinical, the relevant anatomy that we can see here. In the posterior and lateral approach, the greater trochanter in particular is used as a bony landmark. Even more so in the lateral where it's being, an incision is made right around it, going first proximally, then distally. So, as we indicated before, the inferior gluteal nerve is really what you're going to be watching out for during that approach due to its proximity. In an anterior approach, you're going to be going near the anterior superior iliac spine. So naturally, you're going to have to be cognizant of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And then the posterior approach, due to the field that we were doing, and when we were looking at the vasculature before and the neural structures before, we were viewing those from a posterior view. So a lot of those structures, the sciatic nerve, super, superior gluteal nerve and artery, those are going to be of particular note when approaching the surgery in this manner. So continuing our move distal, we're going to start off with our intertrochanteric fractures. So this is a type of extracapsular fracture because now we've moved our way outside of the capsule. Intertrochanteric, as the name might imply, is between the greater and lesser trochanter. So in that area be between those two bony features. As we discussed before, we'll note that the greater trochanter has all of the major hip abductors and the lesser trochanter has the hip flexors. So if you have a fracture between those two areas, you're going to have the bone being pulled in two different in two different directions. So the chance of malunion or, or poor union is going to be increased during this fracture, but it's not as much as what we'll discuss in just a moment. The classification mechanism is the Evans classification mechanism. There is a lot of images that you can see here, but the main classification is the two types. You got type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is going from superior on the greater trochanter to inferior on the lesser trochanter. So kind of going in a more anatomical line. This one has the chance of being more stable and isn't quite the emergency that you would imagine if you had a type 2. Type 2 is going the opposite direction, starting with the lesser trochanter in its most superior aspect and then inferiorly going to maybe the inferior aspect of the greater trochanter. This is going to be highly unstable, so this is always going to require surgery. The research definition of this is going to be the 31A because again, A was extracapsular, and then a risk factor for this is going to be osteoporosis, just like our intracapsular fractures. The surgery that is going to be used for this is most frequently going to be internal fixation. So you're going to have the sliding hip screws that you can see in the image behind me, and the point of insertion is usually the greater trochanter. Again, when, once we have that bony landmark, we're going to be able to be cognizant of what features do we have around us? What neural structures, what vascular structures do we have around us? This particular screw has lots of different complications that can occur because one, you're probably dealing with someone who has osteoporosis. So if you put it in too posteriorly, there's a chance of perforating the femur. And then because their femur is already pretty weak, that perforation can exacerbate and then they may not have a successful healing process. And if you go too laterally or too medially, there's a chance of compromising different aspects of the femur, as you, one might imagine. You can also put in uh, cephalomedullary screws, and then these have two specific areas of uh, insertion. But we'll get more into that in the subtrochanteric fractures. So our subtrochanteric fractures from the most inferior aspect of the lesser trochanter and going about five centimeters distal to that. The main classification is the Seisenheimer classification. There is literally 14 other classification mechanisms for this type of fracture. However, Seisman is the preferred mechanism and also my favorite out of most of these because the type number tells you how many fragments that you have. In a type 1, it's incomplete, so you still have one whole bone. If it's a type 2, it's a complete fracture, so you have two bone fragments. 
If it's type 3, there's going to be three bone fragments. So it's a very intuitive classification mechanism that um, translates very well to the clinical setting. So the OA, eight, uh, OTA classification is 32A. So the 32 is indicating a diaphysis bone. So we're just changing it up a little bit. And then the main complications here are malunion and nonunion. This is because the proximal aspect of the bone, which has the greater and lesser trochanters on it, has the main hip abductors and flexors attached to it. So the proximal aspect of the bone is being abducted and flexed, whereas the inferior aspect of the bone is being adducted. So you're having the bone being pulled in two opposite directions, and the risk for malunion is very high with this type of fracture. The main risk factor that has been getting a little bit of attention is bisphosphonate, which is a treatment for osteoporosis. So unfortunately, it seems that in terms of hip fractures and osteoporosis, there may not be a good escape because osteoporosis increases the risk for your intercapsular and your intertrochanteric fractures, whereas bisphosphonate, a lot of recent literature has been demonstrating that there's an increased risk for subtrochanteric fractures. And you can see that here. This is a from a x-ray from a case study of a person who had a first hip replacement, and then they were taking bisphosphonate for, for their osteoporosis, and they had a subtrochanteric hip fracture. And you can see here that it is in that range, kind of closer to that five centimeter uh, distal to the lesser trochanteric. So I'm going to quickly move away from that uh, gruesome image. So the surgeries, most of these require surgery because of the risk of malunion. Fast action is required due to the fact that you have muscles pulling at two different aspects of this bone. Internal fixation is used, and you have the intramedullary uh, nails that are, can be placed in, which you can see here in the image. The two main areas where the nail can be put in is either the piriformis fossa or the tip of the greater trochanter. However, there has been a lot of literature about is the tip of the tr greater trochanter the best input? In one cadaveric study, they demonstrated that tip of greater trochanter, always the best mechanism to use, always the easiest. However, when they bore it to the clinic, another study demonstrated that sometimes it's a little medial to that area, maybe it's a little lateral, so that using a CT scan really uh, enhanced their ability to uh, customize the surgery for that particular patient. So the jury is still out on which approach is truly the best. So now that we've reviewed all the types of hip fractures, all the different types of surgeries, how is aging related to this? Why is this an age-related disease? Or why is that the way that we think about it? Well, one is the osteoporosis that we saw through most of this, as well as osteo osteoarthritis, just that wear and tear of the joint. And both of these increase the risk of hip fractures. Osteoarthritis in addition to just being normal wear and tear from someone living life, there's also chances for anatomic variations that increase the risk for osteoarthritis and therefore the hip fractures. And you can see these here. You can see that the acetabulum has a little bit of dysplasia. The pistol grip deformity, which is the superior lateral aspect of the femoral neck, is a bit flattened. And you have a widened femoral neck, which explains itself very nicely. So with all of those in mind, there's also another major factor, which is the increased risk for falls. I don't want to get into, is it the fall that causes the hip fracture or the hip fracture that causes the fall? But the thing that we know for sure is that there's an increased risk for falls in the elderly population. There's many factors that go into that, such as their osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. But also we have to keep in mind that many of these folks, they may have an increased risk for diabetes and they'll have low glucose at the time. They may have hypertension. And for all these different medical concerns that they have, maybe may be on four or five different medications and that, that may affect their balance. And then on top of that, with aging, they have increased muscle wasting. So all of these combine for an increased risk for falls. So it is very important to kind of recognize the risk of hip fractures and then the falls that are associated with them. So in conclusion, we recognize the prevalence of hip fractures worldwide and then also in the United States. We were able to categorize the different mechanisms for these hip fractures, uh, went over the anatomy as well as the surgeries. And it's pretty clear with this increasing population of aging folks, 
as well as the increasing amount of hip fractures worldwide, it is imperative for clinicians and anatomists alike to appreciate the clinical anatomy of hip fractures in order to best treat their patients as well as to advance research. Thank you.